Thank you all for resisting the temptation to stay outside in the sunlight this afternoon. And my name is Amir Pasik. I am the Dean of the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. And it is my privilege to welcome you to the 12th Annual Thomas H. Um, uh, Lake Lecture. Uh, the Lake Lecture is a highlight of the year at the Lilly Family School. It draws attention to exceptional work in the field that is nurtured by the Lake Institute on faith and giving. And this year, we are fortunate to have with us a truly exceptional scholar. The Lake Institute is one of the founding pillars of our school. Every year, our Giving USA study shows that religion is the top destination for giving in the United States. But beyond numbers and dollars, our most profound traditions of giving are often tied to those most intimate elements of our identity that are tied to religion. So I am very pleased as the dean that all students who graduate from our school will be aware of the fundamental importance of religion and philanthropy. And this is possible due to the generosity of the Lake family and Lilly Endowment. This is also possible thanks to the person I have the honor to introduce. Charles Bantz became chancellor of IUPUI in 2003. Under his watch, research funding grew by more than 50%, and IUPUI exceeded its first billion dollar campaign by more than 30%. He has led IUPUI to become a vital anchor for the dynamism of Indianapolis and central Indiana by strengthening bonds with the community and supporting the success of our students. The innovative advances in community engagement under Charles's leadership have brought national recognition to IUPUI, including an award from the President of the US. It is also wonderfully appropriate to have the IU Lilly Family School of Philanthropy housed at a university that is a leader in community engagement. In addition to his leadership of the university, we also have Charles to thank for his dedication and commitment to the school and the Lake Institute. We are grateful for his role as one of our school's true founders. Please join me in welcoming Charles Bantz. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. This is, uh, some of you have heard me as I came in, I recognize faces, some of you know. I say this is one of the great experiences of the year for me because it is literally the most intellectual uh, evening of the year. Uh, I have uh, been privileged in the time I've been here to learn something about uh, rabbinical scholarship and uh, interpreting whether or not dirty money needs to be returned. I have uh, learned uh, an incredible series of things from a variety of different perspectives. Uh, on that particular lecture, I still uh, find it amusing how much of it I remember uh, of an incredibly uh, clever, thoughtful, detailed analysis, but that is only one of such uh, kinds of presentations. Uh, it is, I think, a great example of what a university should do, which is to challenge all of us to think uh, deeply occasionally, uh, but always think broadly about what it is uh, we are interested in in our lives. And this topic, uh, of all topics, certainly has that. I want to thank Amir uh, Pasek, uh, both for the welcome, obviously, but also for, uh, as I teased him, uh, he's still at work. Uh, this is a good thing for someone who started in January. Uh, but we appreciate uh, Amir uh, taking this challenge on. It is a great opportunity, we believe, uh, but it is a, a change that does require one to move and to uh, move his family and to take on a new life. So we are really pleased to have him uh, with us uh, in leading uh, the school into its future. We also know that there are any number of other guests here today that we owe a great deal to, uh, including, of course, the founding dean, Gene Temple, and others as I look around and I looking down the row at the Buttry family and, and I see Don and the rest of the family. Uh, and as you've already heard, uh, Karen Lake Buttry and uh, the Lilly Endowment and the support for this has been absolutely uh, amazing and essential to create a anchor, I believe, uh, in the school. So we want to thank all of them for that. We also want to thank the vision of everyone who was willing to help support and create this. I had a conversation once a number of years ago with your president, uh, Father Jenkins, and uh, said to him, some days I confess, I'm envious of a president who has virtually the ability to align 
all the value structure, because of course it's a religious institution, institution. On top of that, he happens to be a theologian, if I remember correctly. And on top of that, he had an institution where he built, the, he built over almost over 100 years, a whole series of things that reinforce the value structure of the institution. Uh, public universities don't do that. Uh, and I said that to him. I said, uh, I, I joke routinely that I'm an aggressive nonpartisan. I have virtually no expressed political beliefs in my job uh, because I'm in a public institution. Uh, I have uh, spiritual beliefs, but frankly, I have been, people have asked uh, me in my time here whether I am a variety of religions uh, in my background, and I count that as an achievement. Uh, that, that, that that is uh, the case. But Father Jenkins made the point that I thought uh, really helped uh, me personally and has helped our campus, which is you have found other ways to bring that unity. And one of the ways you've done that is by focusing on a commitment to improve your community and community engagement. And that literally is part of the basis of the Lake Institute in our institution because it was easy to say this is the right thing to do when you look at a community and know that a single key anchor in any community is the faith community and to understand that relationship and philanthropy is vital. So this is an innovative institution, the Lake Institute, especially in a public university, but it is also, I believe, the right place for it to be. So I want to welcome all of you here. I want to thank the members of the faculty and the Board of Advisors uh, of the Lake, uh, or of the uh, Institute. And I want to thank you especially for your commitment and welcome, of course, our speaker here uh, tonight. But I'm not going to introduce our speaker. I'm going to ask uh, our colleague, uh, who is the director, of the Lake Institute on Faith and Giving, David King, uh, to come forward and do that. Uh, David is a uh, ordained minister. He is a uh, American religious historian uh, and has very broad interests from 20th century religious practice in American and global faith communities and has looked at nonprofits and the relationship uh, to that as well. He also has rhetoric listed as one of his interests, which I always find interesting because I have studied with some uh, rhetoricians in my career. But let's welcome our uh, director of the Lake Institute in order to introduce our speaker tonight, David King. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Bands, for the way that you supported our work at Lake Institute and the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to introduce Christian Smith as our 12th annual Thomas H. Lake Lecturer. Chris is the William R. Kennan, Jr. Professor of Sociology and Director of the Center for the Study of Religion and Society at the University of Notre Dame. He received his MA and PH, PhD from Harvard University and his BA from Gordon College. Before coming to Notre Dame, he taught sociology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for 12 years. As an American religious historian myself, I've been a longtime admirer of Smith's work. He's one of the most prolific and well-regarded American sociologists working today. And not only is Christian prolific, but he has a rare nimbleness as a scholar, serving as a leading voice shaping multiple conversations among both academics and practitioners. I first encountered Christian's work on faith and social movement activism, where he emphasized not only political structures, but also the personal moral motivations at play for social activists. Smith then moved to write some very important books on American evangelicalism that identify the immense cultural complexities within conservative Protestantism. Using a subcultural identity theory, he identified evangelicals as both embattled and thriving. In another award-winning book, Divided by Faith, Smith, along with co-author Michael Emerson, examined evangelical religion and the problem of race. Their conclusions still prove prescient today. But others of you may know Smith's work through his groundbreaking national study of youth and religion. Books like Soul Searching and Lost in Transition delved deeply into the spiritual and religious lives 
of teenagers and now young adults. He coined a phrase, moral therapeutic deism, that has become ubiquitous in the literature around the religious lives of young people and millennials. In 2008, Smith turned his attention to religion and money and published what is still one of the best books examining why Christians give or don't. In Passing the Plate, Why American Christians Don't Give Away More Money, Smith examines the complex reasons for the somewhat limited financial giving of American Christians and suggests that more liberal giving could accomplish world transforming change. That research led Smith to continue a line of research on generosity. In 2009, with a grant from the John Templeton Foundation, Smith and a number of researchers from Notre Dame and around the world began seeking to understand why some people practice generosity and others don't. The result is among the most comprehensive studies of American giving habits ever conducted. Lake Institute on Faith and Giving, the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy have been eager partners in conversation, um, in conversation with the Science of Generosity Project to expand our own understandings of generosity. Smith's most recent book released this fall, The Paradox of Generosity, Giving We Receive, Grasping We Lose. Written along with Hillary Davidson, it demonstrates Christian Smith at his best, writing persuasively, letting the data speak for itself, but also providing us stories, images, and pithy takeaways that demonstrate that generosity is good for us, our communities, and society. There's no better person to offer the Thomas H. Lecture, uh, Thomas, H. Lake, Thomas H. Lake Lecture that examines the broad intersections of faith and giving. Chris will just present a piece of his, of his expansive research on generosity, and we're privileged to have him today. His lecture is entitled The Generosity Equation, Donors, Faith, and Avenues to Giving. Please help me welcome Chris Smith to IUPUI. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, thank you for having me here to give this lecture. I'm very pleased to be here. I see some friends uh, in the audience, which is extra fun. Uh, I hope what I have to say is interesting and useful for the work you all do. I think some of what I'm going to have to say is, uh, is going to confirm stuff that you know, but I also hope that I have some new ideas and provocative uh, insights for you, and I look forward to the discussion after. So I, too, want to thank the Lake and Buttrey family uh, for uh, endowing this lectureship. Uh, but let me get on to what I have to say. So. Um, <clears throat> Instead of starting off with data and findings, I want to start off with a big picture conceptual question of human nature. And the question is, are humans ultimately just selfish or are humans also, in some sense, primordially self-giving? Um, the answer to the question has consequences for how giving might be promoted or encouraged. And we've inherited one particular view that's been the dominant view, and that's been changing. And so I want to talk about that for a little bit. The inherited traditional academic view, the dominant one, not the only one, but the dominant one, is something like rational egoism, that human beings are ultimately and finally self-serving. They can, that can express itself looking in lots of ways as if they help other people, but ultimately it gets back to a fundamentally self-oriented, more or less calculating uh, view of the human person. And this uh, Hobbes would have been one person that articulated this kind of approach, but it's shown up in academia and various uh, schools of thought, rational choice theory, certain versions of neoclassical economics, social exchange theory, and as generally as sort of applying Darwinian uh, natural selection to the, the human uh, social world. Um, but there are new scientific perspectives coming into being that I think are very interesting that relate to the question of generosity. And increasingly that comes from realization from scholars in different fields that um, empirical altruism, that is, it seems to happen in the empirical world. People act altruistically. And empirical generosity cannot be reduced to selfish motives. There have been lots of attempts to try to explain, well, when somebody jumps in front of a train to save a complete stranger, they're really being selfish in this way and that way. 
or Mother Teresa really was self-interested, or something like this. And, but the accumulated realization that there actually is empirical altruism and generosity that happens in the world that we just cannot explain away in any plausible way. The, those have built up as anomalies and have forced uh, consideration of a different view of human nature. And so increasingly emerging uh, are, uh, is a view of humans as naturally, primordially, and spontaneously, not just selfish, which clearly human beings are, or self-oriented, but also self-giving, ready to expend one's own resources and well-being and potentially life for another who may not even be um, known or, bi or biologically related. There's lots of research on this. I'm going to just point to two things very quickly. Neuroscience studies on brain activity, experimental studies on toddlers, but also generally just this theoretical explanation for altruism. We really can't explain it other than having to realize that human beings are more complex than just rational egoists. So one of the projects uh, that my Science of Generosity uh, initiative studies, Dr. Uh, Stephanie Brown, whose focus is on um, neuroscience, brain activity of different kind of work, and I'm not going to get in, into this at all other than to say her work suggests, and neuroscience is tricky stuff, but suggests that the kind of brain activity that happens when people are behaving generously seems to be very closely related to the kind of brain activity that happens when parents are seeing their infants, pictures of their infants, and their infants crying. So that the, the very, very primordial um, maternal and paternal experiences of one's own closest, most vulnerable, needy children, the brain, what's going on in the brain there seems neuro, uh, 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 the, the regions seem to be connected to what also goes on when people are acting generously. That's all I'm going to say about that. If you want to hear more, uh, it's all out there. Um, another project we funded at Harvard by a developmental psychologist um, focused on toddlers, and I want to show a, a few video clips because I think these videos uh, are, are uh, a one video is worth two billion words here. But the idea here is these are experiments of very, very young human beings who haven't even figured out language, and they, they, they're, they're not, they're, uh, the, the, the toddlers are not asked to do anything, they're not directed to do anything, the parent is completely neutral, etc. But it, what it demonstrates is that a certain kind of spontaneous, from within the toddler himself, in these cases, uh, read interest in helping. So let's see if I can make uh, this work here. I love these videos so much, so I thought I had to show them to you. This is oh. the clothespin video. Oh. Oh, yes. Ah, yeah. Okay, you get the idea? Some, maybe Hobbes didn't totally have it right. This is my favorite. This is the cabinet video. Oh. Watch the face on this kid. So the idea is um, none of that doesn't prove anything. It's not an open and shut case. But the idea is the, the assumption of rational egoism that everyone is just scraping against everyone else to maximize their own uh, power, prestige, status and wealth, there's something deeper in human nature that goes along with that that matters, that, that those who study generosity need to take seriously. If that's the case, then thinking about how do you cultivate generosity, I think it means that we are not stuck simply, or if you're a fundraiser, it's not, we're not stuck simply extracting losses from rational egoists. It's not just a matter of, it's not in their interest to give, and they really don't want to give. So how can we set up situations to force them to give or to make them feel guilty if they don't give? 
make them feel pressured through or provide some selective incentives where they realize the $100 the National Public Radio really didn't pay for the mug, but I'll do it. So <laughs> rational egoism can't really explain it, but if human, being, if human nature is more complex than this, then we can say that uh, what encouraging generosity is about is cultivating natural capacities, not artificial, but natural capacities and tendencies to give that are in human beings, and to cultivate them against, or at least in parallel with, selfish uh, tendencies. So what are the consequences of a multi-capacities view? That is, we, are, we have the capacity to be selfish and giving. What are the, some of the consequences of that? for thinking about generosity, well, the question arises, what kind of social, institutional, and cognitive emotional resources, or that is processes, sorry, can be uh, in, in, uh, developed to enhance rather than to retard natural human capacities and tendencies for generous giving? That is, as these toddlers grow up in the world and in different kind of potential societies and institutions that they, and relationships they have. How can those, how can the social world that they grow up into encourage their, the self-giving side of them along with, and not just the selfish side? So to put this graphically, if we take sort of an abstraction of the human being as having both naturally selfish and naturally primordially and spontaneously giving sides, and that this human self goes through a dynamic developmental life process as moving through growing up, that self works through different complex social, institutional, and cognitive emotional processes, and those processes will affect whether the natural giving or the natural selfish side becomes more dominant. Some of them could and do promote more, a more stingy side, and so the size of the, the, height, the triangle on the top, that is the self-giving side, sort of atrophies, and others of them uh, can promote more generosity. So I approach the whole question of generosity. What are these complex social, institutional, cognitive, emotional processes that help in some people to make them more generous and, and other people not? So that's the human nature side as a background setting up the more empirical side. So, the next thing I want to say is, I, I, what I'm thinking I've learned in the science of generosity is how incredibly complex this is. When I first went into studying this, some of you I know are long, knew this a long time ago and could have told me. When I first went into studying generosity, and my particular interest is money, I thought, this will be easy. We have a metric. Many things in social life, there's not a natural metric, but at least you, dollars are dollars, you know, and so, and we can count them, and there's records of this. I thought, finally, I have something concrete and straightforward to study. It turns out it's incredibly complex and difficult, and so it back, back to where all the rest of social science is, that studying generosity turns out to be really complex. I just want to throw out a few things. Again, you probably know, but I think it's always helpful to remember this is not easy stuff. This is complicated stuff. Just the question of why people give, and very many studies show people can give for all sorts of different reasons. Um, solicitation, need, benefit, altruism, reputation. There's a lot that goes into it. Not, it's not simple and straightforward why people give. Another, uh, another uh, huge complexity in all social science, but in, in clearly in here, is the difference between simply identifying what are the demographics of people who give more, which isn't that hard, versus what are the causal mechanisms related to those demographics that actually produce the giving. So it's, that is showing the causal processes rather than just identify this is more, that's less. So knowing that certain kinds of Americans, like college educated or religious, tend to give more money, doesn't it in and of itself explain how or why? And getting at the how or why through research is much more complicated than getting at the who. Another complication, just in a very simple analytical sense, is um, who are the people that give any money, that is one dollar compared to one plus compared to any compared to zero versus how much people give. And the factors related to who's a giver versus a not a giver usually turn out to be quite different than the factors among the givers who tends to give more. So there's all these complex sub-questions. And then, of course, there's the question of causal direction. Which of the factors cause giving? How much does, being, does giving cause some of the factors or both, et cetera? 
another massive uh, complexity has to do with uh, inaccuracy in people's awareness and reporting. I mean, what, I'm a pretty organized person, and one thing I learned interviewing lots of Americans for this project is huge go uh, chunks of Americans have no idea what's going on in their household financially. They don't know what's coming in. They don't know where it's going. And to try to study that and to get them to talk reasonably about it, it's impossible. So, uh, but take the question of tithing. So in our survey, we, we asked, do you tithe? And then later in the survey, we asked, do you give 10% of your income? Which is a different question. <laughs> and then later in the, elsewhere in the survey, we had very precise like 20 different areas of life that mon money could be given to and how much that year was. So we could add it up, compare it to their income, which we also found out, and see how all those things added up. So 23% of the people of our survey people said, I regularly donate at least 10% of my income to religious, charitable, or other good causes. Well, we happen to know that the actual number of those is about 2 or 3%. So there's a huge number of people that think they are, or would like others to think they are, giving 10% of their income when, I'm not saying they're liars, I'm saying when you try to research this, or when you try to raise money from people, we're talking about gross inaccuracies. On the other hand, and this is very interesting too, one third of those who according to the dollars they reported to us vis-a-vis -vis their income, who do give 10% of their income, said no to the above question. Like they didn't realize or think of themselves as giving away 10% of their income. So there's the, 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 the disjunct between reality and people's awareness of what their own reality is can be huge. And that presents a huge research challenge, and I'm sure it presents a huge challenge if you're a minister or if you work for a nonprofit trying to get people's brains aligned with reality. So, uh, this is all still the wind up to what I have to say, and my time is <laughs> probably half over. So, the third thing I want to talk about are what are some of these social, institutional, and cognitive emotional dynamics? In our analysis, um, the two most consistent and strong factors. So now I'm going back to actually the demographic piece. What are the kind of people that tend to give more or things associated with the kind of people? There's value to that, so I'm gonna run through some of these. But then the work we have to do is really think about if those are the kind of people, what are the causal mechanisms associated with that and how can those be implemented to try to encourage more people to be generous? But the two most consistent and strong factors from our analysis and our data, the first one is that somewhere along the line, earlier in life, the people who gave more had made a prior decision to give. And from, from, my, from my best understanding of this, basically some people confront the existential question, do I want to be a giver? Am I somebody that gives away, that shares, or am I not? And then among those people, some people end up saying, yeah, I do, and I'm going to do that. But until people confront the existential question, like I need to decide what kind of a person I am, how I'm going to behave in the world, until somebody does that, and until they say, yes, I am going to, they, it's very easy not to give that much money away. It's very easy to just sort of let all those questions pass on the side. So prior decision to give more. And second, the routinization of giving method. That is, once people have given, the people that give generously have figured out a habit. They've figured out one way or another the percentage, the dollar amount, the envelope, whatever it is. And this is because these kind of activities are so cognitively costly that to continually think all the time, did I give, how am I gonna, it's not gonna happen. I've been on vacation, I forgot this. And, so to give a lot of money requires people structure it into their life routine so they don't even have to think about it. Now there's a paradox here because I just said the first thing is people need to really confront an existential thing and think about it and then they need to figure out ways to stop thinking about it and just make it happen. <laughs> you get that? So this creates a very interesting, uh, uh, the other part of this number two is how do you get people to routinize it so much that they don't have to think about it so much without them completely forgetting about it and, f and not thinking about what is it the good I'm doing in the world? So sometimes in churches I get asked, could we just set up a credit card kiosk in the narthex? And so, I mean, that's a good question, is how routinized to make it before it becomes self-defeating. Anyway, these factors are huge. On a completely different level, personality, beliefs, and values, this is not rocket science, but it really, really makes a difference. People's view toward the world, their sense of their self and their attitudes or their beliefs about the world, 
There are some people who really think everyone has a social responsibility to take care of everyone else. And there are some people that don't think that. They think, I'm responsible, I mean, these are very interesting conversations at their kitchen table when people say, I'm responsible for my own ass and everyone else is responsible for theirs and that's the end of the story. I don't know anybody anything. That, not surprisingly, makes a big difference if people are willing to share of their resources with other people. Generally, a, a view of uh, like an ont a social ontology of social solidarity, that is, we're all interdependent upon each other. Human, hum humans need each other. That view is also very, very much people that give generously have that view as opposed to an atomistic, individualistic view of things. And then to personally identify as a self to say, I'm a generous giver. To be able to have part of one's repertoire of identities, I'm somebody who gives. I'm a generous person. That clearly, now again, we get to, which is the cause and effect here? I can't say. But to have this embedded in a sense of self not just an external behavior that I took care of is associated with generous giving. Uh, another factor is um, perceptions of the world. We know that the, how generous people are and people's capacity to be generous are extremely loosely correlated. There's a very loose coupling between the resources people have to give and how much they do give, right? And that's because between the amount of income somebody has and whether they give that is their perception of the kind of the world they live in. And one of the key piece perceptions is, do we live in a world of abundance or scarcity? And, we, and somebody can be super rich and think they live in a world of scarcity, and somebody could really not have much and understand themselves as living in a world of abundance, of a blessing, of I'm not gonna fall apart if I share with somebody else. So there's this, again, this is existential question of what kind of world do I live in? And people that give away money more money, understand themselves as blessed, as having a lot, that look at how much there is around us, look at how much I have, and then from that they see that what they're doing is it's overflowing to people around them. Whereas, and again, this has nothing to do with savings and income, uh, people can look at the world as I'm always threatened, something could go wrong tomorrow, I better plan, I better hold on to what I have, I can't share it. Those kind of people obviously don't give away much money. Also, how materialistic people are, just how much pleasure people get in shopping and buying things is very strong. So the people that tend to give away more money are those that don't really think if you die with the most toys, you win. I'm sorry. Uh, they just don't take, they don't take life satisfaction in terms of material possessions. And so that opens them up to an understanding of um, life, what they want to spend their money on experiences more than things, and a certain kind of experience is sharing with others and making change happen in the world and helping to support causes and organizations that they believe in and so on and so on. So the divide between a thing, a materialistic, a thing-oriented world versus an experience and uh, uh, not worried about continually acquiring things is uh, one of a small handful of these things that I'm talking about that relate to giving more money. Um, two other factors, I'm finally getting around to religion here. Uh, people that give more money had parents who gave more money and taught them to give. So again, this is not rocket science, but it's really important. Um, little kids are impressed. I mean, it just, if, it forms, it seems to form people for life. When they grew up in a family, their parents just gave money away and told them this is how you live, this is just what you do. And a lot of very, a lot of quite generous people that we interviewed, um, pretty much most of them were religious, uh, uh, and they didn't have a lot of resources, but they gave a lot of their money away. They didn't even think about what they were doing. I mean, they weren't even proud of it. They just thought, I'm just living. I mean, isn't this what people, what you're supposed to do? So there wasn't even this, wow, I'm so great, and let me tell you. It was just like, I guess that's what I, I mean, it was almost un not unselfconsciously, this is just what a good human being does, and I want to be a good human being, is what my parents did. And um, they may be part of the one-third that doesn't report that they give 10%. So parent modeling and teaching is important. Obviously, we know this, although I'm going to get around to, some people are now questioning this, religious service attendance, um, a frequent uh, a service, a religious service attendance, also associated with giving more money, especially when within the religious services there are more explicit calls to give. 
Now, there are some religious congregations where money is never talked about. I've interviewed some pastors who are terrified to talk about money. They hate, it's the thing they hate about their job the most. Uh, they feel like they're raising their own salary and it makes them just completely uncomfortable. So within religious congregations, there's a whole spectrum of how the question is addressed. And, but one way or another, um, those people give more who not only attend religious services more, but are in religious services where it's directly said, you need to be somebody who gives money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, social networks, this is something sociologists are interested in. Uh, one of the people we funded, Nicholas Christakis at Harvard, now at Yale, has shown in lots and lots of research how powerful social networks are. People's body weight is very much affected by their place in social networks and the body weight of all sort of people they're connected to and all the people they're connected to. So the likelihood of somebody becoming very, uh, a very heavy is, is significantly affected by who they know. So, and, and social networks affects tons of things in the world. And so the main point here is that um, people give more who are surrounded by people who give more and believe in giving more. So whether one is married, again, this is not rocket science, but it's good to know whether people are married to somebody who believes in it and supports it and shares the same view of giving or who's sort of dragging their feet and why you're giving away all this money for, that we need for our vacation home or whatever. Um, people who have friends who are givers. People who perceive that their local community is populated by people who are generous are more likely to give. Now, this is pure correlation. It could be, we have all the open questions in this case of how do the causal directions and ordering and work and through perceptions and so on. But the basic point is um, giving is not just an individual or even a household thing. It's connected to relationships, it's connected to networks, it's connected to social influence that happens in relationships and communication. Okay, so those are some cognitive institutional uh, and social uh, dynamics that I'm gonna circle around to in a bit. But before I do that, I'll say one more thing on uh, sort of influences, and that is, Everything, much of social science research operates on the model, if you know statistics of multiple regression, independent variables, that is, the effect of a variable net of the effect of every other variable in the model. And that's one way to do things, but it's also severely limited. Another way to think about it is what combinations of factors tend to go cluster together empirically to give rise to more giving. Or if you think about, um, you can't make a cake by just setting ingredients on the table separately. You have to mix them together, right, and put them in a certain conditions of heat and so on uh, for you to get a cake. So if we think about generous giving as a cake, so to speak, an outcome, what ingredients need to, what are the recipes that could, that, that in the real world tend to give rise to more generous giving? This set, this analysis sets aside the existential decision and the routinization. It focuses on the more proximate variables. And this is, if you care about this stuff, it's called fuzzy set and QCA analysis. But here are the recipes that give rise to more generous giving. And they're, co they're color coded. The, the darkest is, has to do with personal identity. I'm a generous person. Um, the orange is parental modeling. The green is a religious attendance where there's um, calls for giving and the blue is one form or another of social network. And you can see that there are clusters of these things. There's strong patterning. There, there, I don't have time to go into, you can see right here, this actually lower personal identity and lower spousal alignment. You must have lower in this combination, but it's made up for all these other things. So it's very complicated, I don't have time to go into it. But here's what I'm gonna say in my way of summary observation. Every recipe has high social network support for giving. There are few to no loan givers out there. This is, giving money is not a, not a process that people figure out in their heads and do, whether or not Jesus said do it so nobody can see what you're doing is a separate question, but the way things work in this culture and society, how much people give is very much affected by who they know and who they know's attitude and behaviors toward giving. So the, 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 atomis, the atomism again of the behavior we need to question. It's a social network dynamic. 
Also, four of the five recipes require religious calls to give. And the one recipe that did not include religious calls had all the other, every one of the other social network factors at work together, spouse, parents, friends, community, and there's a, 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 in community here we also wrapped in national perception. Are you part of a, a, a society that is generous? Another observation is four out of the five recipes required parental modeling and teaching to give. So there's really something about a long-term life formation and trajectory from childhood that people learn uh, that affects their giving. The one recipe that did not include parental modeling and teaching had all other positive social networks effect, effects again. So let's think about some action implications. I'm going to say a whole list of, if you want to encourage people to be more, more generous in giving money, these are the sort of things that we could do. I know that every one of these you're going to reply by saying, well, how do I do that? And I'm going to say, I don't know. That's what you have to figure out. But these are, <laughs> these are the, in principle, if these things could be done, conceptually, probably they should lead to more generous giving. One is to find ways to help more people confront the existential question of giving and to make a decision. That is to stop ignoring the question, to really, really confront what kind of person do I want to be? Uh, in the book, that, uh, in the book uh, Passing the Plate, we coined this idea of comfortable guilt, that there are a lot of people out there who feel guilty because they're not giving what they wish they were giving. They want to be more generous. They can't quite get themselves to do that, and they feel guilty about it, but they're not so uncomfortable that they're going to do anything about it. So they're comfortably guilty about it. But it means they're cognitively they're aware of it, and there's some tension going on, just not enough. Um, so, but getting people to confront it and make a decision one way or another, that's one idea. Another is to encourage routine giving one way or another, to minimize the cognitive cost through habituation. The other is to somehow surround people with others who are generous givers, although the next point I think is important, and that is people may be surrounded by others who are generous givers and not know it, because very many people don't want to brag about their giving. So a huge question is, for if the social network finding is true, how can we get people to talk properly about their giving that encourages others to give that doesn't sound like tooting their own horn, bragging, all the negatives that we would associate with that? How, how can we talk openly about, I really believe in this, and I support it, and I give in a way that doesn't turn people off? I think that's a really big question because people can be surrounded by others who are generous and not know it if people aren't talking about it. Or another way to put that is, how can generous people encourage the ones around them to be generous without it turning people off, coming off as obnoxious, grandstanding, etc.? cetera? Uh, religious congregations need somehow to figure out more how to make direct, explicit calls and not be apologetic, to not be avoiding and saying this, this, and, and my, the, I don't have time for this, but I have a whole thing in this first book about in religious congregations, there's, a, there's kind of a two different ways this is approached. One is, look, folks, if you're part of this organization, we have bills to pay, so cough it up. <laughs> and uh, the other is, we have a vision for what we're trying to do here. We're on a mission. We're doing something great in the world. This is really important. And you would be lucky to get on board it. The, so the living the vision, I think, gets people more energized and jazzed to be more, because people want to be part of something bigger. Most of life is pathetically boring and horrible, right? So people want to be, if, they, if people can get a vision of something bigger themselves that really matters, that they actually could have influence over, they can get excited about that. But what's not exciting is, you know, we can't pay our electric bill, so here comes the plate. So it, the, the type of calls for giving clearly matters here. Parents uh, need to be encouraged to, now this won't, take effect for another 10, 20, 30 years, but parents should be encouraged to teach their children. I, myself, my, at one point, m my wife and I realized, we give all this money and our kids have no idea. They're completely clueless. So we were finally we just realized, you know what, we should sit down and tell them what we're doing and why we're doing it. Not a big deal, but just teach them, otherwise it could go right over their heads. So again, figuring out how to be explicit, but appropriately explicit and teaching about it. Um, somehow, don't ask me how, but to cultivate against, don't ask me how against concern, uh, commercialism and everything, but to cultivate an, atti an attitude of abundance and gratitude that I live in a world that's got plenty in it, 
And in my household, we have plenty. And I'm thankful for that. That completely reframes reality in a way that enables the people to be generous. If it's not reframed that way, people are not going to be generous. They're going to protect themselves. Cultivate life satisfaction, not in material possessions, but in good life experiences, including world change through generous giving. Cultivate a belief in human interdependence and solidarity and responsibility, and encourage people to identify somehow with, I am a generous giver to causes I believe in, to get people to own that, to think of themselves that way, um, and, and to communicate it to others. All right, I'm out of time, but I'm going to go over a little bit because the next thing is interesting and not, and not too much longer. But uh, do religious Americans really give more money than non-religious Americans? It's common knowledge that, of course, they do. But this has become uh, questioned recently. And there are two issues in this. One is conceptual and one is empirical. The conceptual question is, if most religious giving is to one's own congregation, is that really generous or is that self-serving? Um, is it charitable, or is it just helping one's kids to have a good place to go once a week sort of thing? I mean, this is the conceptual question. Should it count as charitable giving to give to your congregation? That can be extended in all, I mean, that, it raises huge conceptual questions about what counts as generous, et cetera. But the, this is the question that's being put on the table. The other is empirical, and some people are saying, I don't think religious people actually give that much more if you look at it right or take seriously inconclusive studies and so on. So I just want to address this really quickly, and then I'll be done. Uh, here's an example, though, does, uh, from an article published last year by Roy uh, Sablowski, Does Religion Foster Generosity? And he basically says, I don't think so. I think we need to give up the idea that religion actually makes anybody more generous. So these are just data from my Science of Generosity survey. Our data, at least, say absolutely, whether it's measured in terms of religious service attendance or importance of religious faith, um, religious people are much more likely to donate money and to donate more money. Also, I'm not going to take the time here, but um, a little bit more than half of the money that regular religious service attenders give goes to religion. So the huge, a, a major minority chunk of their money doesn't go to religion. No, they're not just giving to religion. And then the question is, um, when that all pans out, uh, how much uh, of religious giving uh, goes to not religious causes? And so the, this is the final slide. Among givers, that is, if you take people off the table who don't give anything, of which there are more than a few, Monthly plus religious service attenders give nearly the same to non-religious causes as infrequent and non-attenders, which is to say religious giving is above and beyond non-religious giving, not a substitute for it, if that makes sense to you. So my answer to the question, do religious Americans really give more money than non-religious Americans, is yes. We've learned a lot uh, this evening, and we want to have some time for some dialogue, Chris, if that's okay with you. Uh, and I invited <laughs> If it we, isn't, we, then we'll have you. <laughs> I wanted you to at least opt in. Yeah. <laughs> we have three panelists here. We want to invite into dialogue, have a few questions um, from what you've presented with us today. Let me introduce them to you briefly. Uh, Brian Steensland is professor of sociology at IEPY and Director of the Social Science Research um, at the Center for the Study of Religion and American Culture here at IEPY. He's a fellow sociologist with interest in religion, culture, civic engagement, politics, and contemporary American society. And his most recent book, co-edited with Philip Goff, also here at IEPY, is The New Evangelical Social Engagement. And his first book, The Failed Welfare Revolution, won multiple scholarly awards. Brian earned his PhD from Princeton. Uh, to Brian's left is Sarah Conrath, who's an assistant professor of philanthropic studies here at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. She received her PhD in social psychology from the University of Michigan. And she's the director of the Interdisciplinary Program on Empathy and Altruistic 
or, and empathy and altruism research, or iPAIR. And you can see iPAIRlab.org for more information. But it's a research lab with a primary focus on motivations, traits, and behaviors relevant to philanthropic giving, voluntary, uh, volunteering, and pro-social behavior. And in her current work, she's using mobile phones to implement empathy building programs. Sarah, I believe you're presenting at South by Southwest just later this week on just that type of topic. Besides being published in top scientific journals, she also has been uh, interviewed with outlets that we're more aware of, like CNN, New York Times, Huffington Post, uh, and NPR Radio. And then we have Jay Gachet, who is the Senior Vice President of Community Impact and Fundraising at the United Way for Central Indiana. And Jay oversees relationships with 90 plus nonprofits here in our community serving the human service needs of our community and leads corporate engagement and investor relations, um, those teams to raise over $43 million annually for our community. Before joining United Way, uh, Jay worked with Eastman Kodak, IBM, and, and started the Dodson Group. Jay has a BS in engineering from Purdue uh, and then a master's of management from the Kellogg Graduate School at Northwestern and a master's of divinity from Christian Theological Seminary here in Indianapolis. So Brian, let me turn first to you. Uh, Chris talked about ingredients, yeah. uh, recipes. W were there any of those ingredients that stood out to you? That yeah, so um, one of the things that I really like about Chris's work is that he takes us from the existential uh, questions about what is the nature of human generosity? Are we, are we altruistic? Are we, are we uh, uh, self-serving? Um, to questions like, should we have an ATM in the North X? So it's, it, it really kind of <laughs> runs the, the gamut. And um, the, two of the main points that, that, you, that you talked about were what I kind of conceptualize as being about inspiration on the one hand and routinization on the other. Um, and in terms of, of inspiration, um, one of the things that struck me from Chris's book, The Paradox of Generosity, that I don't think he had time to talk about, was that acts of generosity uh, uh, give the person who's being generous a really profound sense of empowerment. And one of the things that he talks about is that acts of giving are not simply altruistic. They can, they can benefit us, and they can, they can empower us in ways that kind of split this difference between um, making ourselves feel good, causally efficacious, and also helping those that are, that are uh, um, benefiting from that generosity. So I, I, I wonder, since I think all of us kind of realize that we as people kind of live through stories where we, we, we have narratives about ourselves, we have narratives about the world, um, in terms of increasing generosity, are there things that you see from your study that we might be able to incorporate in what we could call narratives of generosity that might incorporate things like empowerment, feelings of empowerment? Mm. Um, are, there, are there narratives that, that we could be more effective at um, communicating to people. Um, one of the paradoxes of generosity, right, is that we benefit, you know. Mm -hmm. So how can we, what are stories that we can tell about ourselves and about our world? Um, is there anything from your data that would give us clues about that? Should I answer now? Or yeah, we please, just... yeah. Um, you told us you weren't gonna, you, you were gonna leave that to us, but we're gonna put it okay, yeah. to um, No, that's an excellent question, and I have to think about points from the data, but my, my initial thought is that what you're saying connects to what I was also saying about how, to, how do more generous people communicate their generosity without being obnoxious. And one way to do that is not to say, look at how great I am, or here's what you should do, but to just say, you know, in, in narrative form, here's where I was in my life, here's what I started to think about, or what, I mean, different people have all different stories, deaths in the family or whatever. Here's the process I went through narratologically to lead me to make this decision, and here's, here's, what, here's why I keep doing it. I mean, here's how it changed me, or here's what I see I've been able to do in the world. So it seems to me that the answer, how can people be more open in communicating their experience, relates to precisely what you're talking about, which is almost to give testimony to, here's what I went through without laying trips on other people, but at the same time, and, and giving people narrative tools that they might be able to reconstruct their own stories or move forward with them in a way 
that they become more generous. Mm -hmm. That's my first thought. I'd have to go back in the data and think yeah. about the elements that may be part of that. Yeah. Well, Brian, let me uh, follow up with you too about your sociologist of religion. I am. I am. Uh, Chris began to push us in the direction of religion towards the end, and, and we, we talk about measuring religion in, in many different ways, whether it's service attendance, belief, practice. Um, you've looked at questions of defining um, religious groups in that way. Uh, how did that strike you as far as that type of conversation? Uh, is there a better way to frame it? Or? Well, so um, one of the things that a lot of empirical studies of religion find is that when we, when we see that religion matters, when it, when it shapes what people do um, and how people feel, right, whether they are more likely to volunteer, now we um, see the connections between that and giving, whether it's people's um, sense of well-being. Um, one of the ways that religion matters is through what we call social network effects, right? That um, people feel supported in kind of um, dense religiously based social ties. They uh, are more likely to see role modeling. Um, they're more likely to have that as their kind of um, major source of identity. And so um, I think the relationship between how religion matters and it mattering through religiously based networks of some type or another, um, I think looks like um, a real point of intervention, I think, to bring about greater generosity. Now, one of the interesting things about a lot of the data that, that Chris um, presented was that it's associational, right? We associate more generosity with these kinds of attributes. And so, as I think about social networks, I wonder, kind of, you, and, and you hinted at this, what are ways that we can bring people into relationship, fellowship, community um, in ways that will foster a greater sense of generosity? We, we can talk about what people believe. Um, we can talk about people's dispositions and motivations, but a lot of the ways that social scientists find that religion is efficacious um, is through uh, social ties, social networks, especially either at the congregational level or at the kind of organizational level if we're talking about things mm -hmm. like nonprofits. Um, so I guess the kind of general question of how does religion matter, that's how I tend to think about it, at least when it comes to things like generosity. Could I add one point Please. to that? So Brian has uh, revolutionized this categorization in the study of American religion with an, elite, an article that he was the lead author on. And so one point that I want to make clear here is we're talking, we're using the word, the generic word religion, American religion. But within American religion, not only within a congregation are they very generous and not very generous, but within traditions, religious traditions, there are huge differences. So at the top, Mormon or LDS people give huge amounts of money, and there are sociologically explicable reasons why that have to do with the sort of things Brian was just talking about right here. Um, and then other traditions like Catholic, which I'm Catholic, are, uh, they're te we're terrible givers. I mean, we're horrible <laughs> among uh, American Christian groups at the bottom. So that raises, another, it's another kind of natural experiment how do, what about the differences of traditions, their beliefs, their theology, their practices, their sense of community, whatever, help to explain if otherwise they're all working at this corporation and they're, otherwise they live in the same neighborhoods and go to the same schools, what is it about the tradition differences and what can that inform us about these kind of dynamics that are at work? Well, I'm grateful for our conversation about sort of the layers of peeling back the onion to see what's there with, with the diversity of religious communities. And, and particularly, I think it's a way we can engage uh, as an audience, no matter which way we engage the conversation, with thinking, of, thinking about communities, invitations into these conversations. Um, Sarah, your work, in many ways, is, is the closest to Chris's own as far as looking at, at altruism and, and Chris's work finds uh, a connection between generosity, health, and happiness. Uh, is that something you found in your own work? Is that? Yes, and I really enjoyed your book. Um, one of the things we find is it's not just the giving behaviors that matter, but actually the reason why people give. So I'd, I'd love to know more about whether you found anything similar. So for example, we looked at volunteers, and we found that if they say they volunteer because some other oriented reason, so they want to help others, or it's important to someone they love, they're actually less likely to die. This is a sample of older adults. 
compared to if they say the reason they volunteer is because maybe they want to learn new things or mm. feel better about themselves. So I'm just wondering more about not just the behavior, but the reasons behind the behaviors. Yeah. That's really interesting. And I totally believe it. I haven't focused on that. So okay. I wish I could say, yes, we've done the exact same well, thing. Well, do you have any ideas about uh, what, why this might happen? I mean, the pro well, from, from the Paradox of Generosity book, there are multiple causal mechanisms, everything from brain chemistry to um, getting up off the couch and doing something physically right. to developing new senses of social identities and social interactions that have upwardly and downwardly spiral moving causal consequences like this. And so I think those, I would think those kind of outcomes and differences would be a result of the Intern, the, uh, how to put this, the sort of the internal formation of a sense of self and purpose in life and motivations uh, that open people up cognitively and emotionally to different, and uh, they sort of create grids through which feedback to them can affect them differently. Uh, what they're tuned into, what will matter to them when they're volunteering. Um, the other thing I would say though, I mean, so. It part, it's all so complicated. Part, part of what goes on has to do with where people are, mm -hmm. like what you're describing. Part of it is people are completely clueless about and forces operate on them, whether they know it or intend it, they're still affected by whether they're volunteering or writing a check and so on. So I think this part of the complexity to parse out is how much does subjective engagement with what's happening matter and how much of it is just fake it till you make it, just behave in a certain way and that's formative of us. As Persons. And that's where, if I can ask one more question, I was very interested by your findings that people don't really seem to know how much they give when it comes to tithing. And I know in your book you present a result showing that people who tithe um, have better health and well-being outcomes. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do you think the people who think they tithe but don't really <laughs> have better health outcomes? I mean, is there a placebo effect? If you think you're a giver, you're, you're fine? Right, that's good. That's a good question. They may, be, they may be gaming the system, yeah, I mean, they... <laughs> Don't try this at home. <laughs> According to my theory and understanding of things, they should, unfortunately, they should uh, benefit more than people who are living in comfortable guilt. Even if objectively they're not giving 10%, if they think they are, that should affect them in their cluelessness, even yeah. if they don't deserve it. <laughs> yeah. I think you made some people happier. <laughs> well, to follow up on, the, on these type of differences, I know, Sarah, in some ways, in your own research, you found that empathy as a personality trait, in many ways, is declining among younger Americans, and narcissism is actually on the rise. Um, are there are there generational differences that you see in your work? And, and, and Christian, we might ask the same for you. Do you break it down, having spent a lot of time on youth and young adults yourself? So in fact, that is the finding, is that there are general dif uh, gener generational differences in traits related to giving, like empathy, which inspires um, our concern for others and our compassion, and narcissism, which is basically, I think we all know, from the person in our mind when you say the word narcissism, but it's people who are think, basically think of themselves and not others very often. Um, so the, the millennial generation is among the lowest uh, empathy and highest narcissism in recent generations. So I'm, I did wonder about whether you looked at that in your data. Yeah, I, I, I have not done that exact analysis. I mean, basically what's required though is to pull apart age effects from cohort effects exactly. and see if younger people are less oriented toward giving, what are they going to look like when they're 45? Yeah, so in and our... And it's a little hard to do yeah. with our... I mean, exactly. it's impossible to do with my data set. In principle, it could be done and should be done, but... Yeah, so in our work, we tracked 20-year-olds from 30 years ago, and then 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and now, and, and yeah. that's how we did it. So that's a, yeah. a cohort, but yeah, with a single data set, you can only say whether the younger people are uh, more generous or not. Right. My guess is that there are both of kind of effects, that there are age effects, that people can be totally self-oriented and then when they get a job, have kids, et cetera, et cetera, they learn things when they're older. But also that there are cohort effects. Yeah. I, I'm not at all surprised that certain cohorts will grow up and be oriented 
differently toward the public world, the civic space than older generations. And in terms of the age effects, I think uh, your discussions about practices of generosity probably matter because I think any parents uh, or caregivers of children in the audience would know that that's a, a practice that you can't avoid <laughs> as soon as you have a baby. Um, yeah. It's a daily, minute by minute yeah. thing. And yeah. I've heard the first 40 years are the hardest, so we'll see how the rest goes. <laughs> well, well, Jay, to turn the, the conversation your way, you're, you're a practitioner. You're, yeah. you're a fundraiser. You work with donors. You work with service providers and recipients. And often in, in fundraising, we talk about the benefit that the recipient will receive uh, and not about the benefit that the giver receives. Mm -hmm. um, so as a fundraiser, how do, how do you or how could we speak to donors about uh, to create the narrative that, that Chris has mentioned right. to us? Right. Chris, I really enjoyed your talk and your book as well. And uh, so as I thought through that, some images came to my mind like the um, Christmas Carol mm -hmm. and uh, the Scrooge mm -hmm. or It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. And uh, as, you know, in fundraising, uh, we we probably resonate with the concept you talked about was rational egoism and wrenching those dollars out of a scarce mentality. Um, but for the most part, really, as, as I've had the opportunity to work here in Indianapolis, it's a very generous community. And uh, through mentors and those who have uh, kind of helped me in this field, it's, it's really introducing individuals to the joy of giving. And you talked about that, um, uh, that setting the vision rather than paying the bills. Mm -hmm. And I, I look at United Way as an organization that has, is making that change from a deficit funding mentality to trying to set a vision of what the community could be through effective community impact. And um, it's interesting, as I sat here and reflected on some of these conversations, I have been put into a position that uh, formerly was just fundraising, uh, and, or my other position was just community impact. And uh, our organization has pulled those together, and I have the opportunity to serve in that position of fundraising and community impact. Because uh, United Way cannot be a fundraising organization. We see it has to be a missional organization that is creating change. Um, it is interesting, though, as, we, as I listen to your talk, the, the question I wanted to get to, which I think uh, is the next one that I listed as well, is we fundraise primarily through a very routine method of payroll deduction. And uh, we really are not effective in that monthly payroll deduction of encouraging people to consider the joy of why they gave that. And so in the very beginning of a campaign or a fundraise effort, we try to uh, set a vision of why people should give. But then during the course of that payroll deduction, it becomes a very routine process. And then next year, a year from now, we have to uh, uh, declare them to give again. We have a 91% retention rate of our high givers, of those who give $5,000 or more. Because all during the year, we're very intentional. The, the team is very intentional of getting in front of those donors and building relationships and reminding. But we have a 50% loss rate of those who give very small amounts, but give generously, I'm sure, by their means. And, and I think it's because we, we're not in front of them. Uh, and they, go, they do it for a very routine method. And so I really resonated. and. Um, didn't know if you have any thoughts of how do you not, you know, you said that's the challenge and we have to figure it out, but I was hoping maybe you could help us figure it out. And as a good volunteer of United Way, you could contribute in this way, so. Yeah, that's a really, a really interesting statistics you yeah. have and a really interesting question. And I, my first answer to most everything is, well, it's really complicated. It would take a yeah, long thanks, discussion to. But one thought I have that, that speaks to that that has been something that's changed in my mind about organizational process is I think a lot, uh, I think a lot of um, where fundraising and people's giving goes wrong is the information loop isn't closed all the way back to the donor. 
the people that are raising money and using it for impacts are mostly focused on doing the very best in the world that they can. Mm -hmm. And they hope that they get something, they hope that they will get the support. But I think to keep the cycle going and going and spiraling up, it really, people need to see more than I think they often do what they're accomplishing. It gets back to the empowerment, it gets back to the sense of I'm part of something bigger than my little life. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid that the interest in using every last dollar for an impact in the world has the unintended consequence of skimping on information feedback to donors, so mm -hmm. to speak. So when I think, when I think sort of how I was raised about what's a good organization to give to, one criterion is those that have the lowest overhead, right. that most of it goes out the door, they're not spending it on right. themselves. But I've started to question that on this one point, and that is, maybe more money needs to be spent in-house, administratively, to get more information back to the givers. And that that's, that's worth it, not just you'll get more dollars in the end instrumentally, mm -hmm. but the kind of world it helps to create, the kind of culture it helps to shape over time, the mm -hmm. kind of impact it has on the donors. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if in some ways we need to uh, back off on the we don't want to spend any money on our in-house operation. If the in-house operation is actually helping givers to be part of something, rather than to feel like, oh, here's the announcement in my mailbox again. I guess I should do this. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. If I could follow up with something. Um, a few of us attended uh, a conference in which uh, another fellow researcher, Penelope Burke, spoke. And uh, one of the things she drove home was that feedback loop. The feedback loop. Yes. Yeah. And she talked about the thank you note, right? And she, and she talked about, in the book, as you did, she talks about that um, chemical reaction that goes on in that feedback loop. And that um, givers love to give. But what really triggers them is when they see the impact of the gift, and that therefore that thank you note or that feedback mechanism formalized through the thank you note really sparks those chemicals that you refer to in the book to encourage them to feel happier, to encourage them to feel more generous. Um, any thoughts on that? Because I think the thank you note process is one way that we formalize it. We're now doing it through social media with clips of video mm -hmm. and using social media in that way. But mm -hmm. uh, any comments on that? But well, I mean, the first thing I think is that it's good to realize moving in this direction isn't just manipulating donors. Right. I mean, right. it's working with the way reality works mm -hmm. to help it to move in positive and good directions, given the way we are as the kind of animals we are, basically. So that's the first thing. The second thing, and I'm somewhat repeating myself, is, is, to th is to always tune into, are there any black holes? Do people feel like they give money and they never hear back? Mm -hmm. And so that's closing the information feedback loop. Mm -hmm. One or, and I think there are some organizations, and so people end up giving on trust that I know this is a good organization, yeah. but they don't concretely get to see it, and they don't get to benefit by being part of it. Another model, if you think about um, child sponsorship programs, World Vision, uh, Compassion, I mean, you, uh, they've, they're set up, you adopt a specific kid, it's not just third world hunger, but uh, you, you, have, you get letters, you write them, there's a bond, that, and so there's the feedback loop gets connected. I am actually improving the life of a particular child in El Salvador. I'm not saying everyone should do that, but I think that's a, one model of how people feel a deep reward, and the, from what I know from a lot of those organizations, their donors just keep coming up with more money to get another and another and another. That, and so that shows how, and I would imagine the thank you letter, even the kind of thank you letter, uh, if the more personal it is and the more it explains, here's what you help to do in the right. world, the more that helps to cultivate at a cognitive emotional level mm -hmm. what's already naturally there in people that we think is good. Thank you. It seems like it's always that both and that you started us with. It has to be an identity understanding of myself as a giver, as, as generous, and the, the routinization in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. I think we have a few brief minutes. We have some microphones. Does anybody have a question from the audience? And we can, if you could raise your hand, we have some microphones that could come down. Uh, maybe I can, I can try, I can talk loud enough to hear me. 
Go ahead and yell. Here comes a microphone, if you can. My name is Masood Sohail. I'm a visitor here. So maybe I wasn't really with you on all the points that you raised. One thing I think in giving, you should be, there should be aim for it. Where you are giving, what the money is going for. I think you have to clarify that when you ask anybody to give money, or whatever, or, or time, or money, or whatever it is, you know, time is also money. So I think the, uh, another point uh, which I think you raised was the abundance. Maybe I have got a lot of money, a lot of resources. Maybe I feel guilty. I want to give and share it with others. Maybe that sort of a concept can be developed. Thank you. Um, if I understand your question, uh, I, guess, I guess the point about abundance is that there, there is an objective reality that people do or don't have resources. And people can't give what they don't have. Um, but that objective reality is powerfully mediated through subjective perceptions and judgments and orientations to the world. And um, so uh, in, in many cases, people, I mean, this is, this is the parable of the widow's might, I guess. But in many cases, people really can find ways to give generously, given who they are and what their lives are like that can affect them powerfully um, because they have a different orientation toward the world, net of their actual ability to give. I should say one other thing to add on to this uh, is we, we identify in the book Par uh, Paradox of Generosity, there's a certain very small percentage of people we call pathological givers. And that is they give really generously when they shouldn't be. They're giving for the wrong reason. They're hurting other people by the way they give. They're ru ruining their own health and their own financial well-being. So uh, it's complicated. There are some cases where you want to tell people, take, go take care of yourself for a year, and then we'll talk about it. So this isn't directly related to what you're saying. But again, it gets back to the complexity. And it gets back to the motivations. And the per some people want to give to please other people in a way that doesn't help anybody. And so that kind of complexity, I think, needs to be built in as well. The other thing I want to make a pitch for, and it was alluded to here, that is paradox of generosity makes a very strong argument that the generous giving has got to be practiced, not just one time random. People benefit when there's a practice ongoing, not just, so whenever I see, I hope I'm not offending you, whenever I see the bumper sticker, uh, random acts of kindness and that I feel like saying, well, you're not going to live, you can do that, but you're not going to live longer as a result. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but really, it's, it's habituating. It's building it into the structure of our beings and our lives, not just, oh, I mean, if somebody does something randomly, that's great, but that's, that ultimately isn't going to make the nonprofit world go around, right? right. It's got to be institutionalized. Hi, I'm Janet Wakefield, and I'm a youth worker, so I've been in the youth development field my whole life. And so I have a question about um, your comment about parents are the way that we grow philanthropists, that that sense of giving is from parents. But if you're going to have, if you're going to increase the number of young people who grow up believing that they can give and make a difference in the world, couldn't or do you think other things like organizations and other interveners that maybe aren't the parents could also help uh, increase that possibility? Yeah, sure. I mean, none of this is deterministic. And if I ran you through all the numbers of, the, of those recipes, there are other ways that things happen. These are just the dominant recipes that things work. Uh, so sure, it's not, it's not a uh, necessary or sufficient condition. You either have parents or it's all over. Um, but, I but, but then I think that requires drilling down deeper into, OK, look at the cases where somebody grew up who didn't have parents that acted this way or modeled this way. What other kind of interventions or influences uh, can make a difference in people's lives? For my other, not on generosity, but for my study of youth, we know that uh, parents are powerfully important, but there are quote unquote parent substitutes. If the parents aren't there, there's aunts and uncles and grandparents and youth ministers and other people that can be parent-like roles. And so I think we can transpose that into this. If somebody didn't have something growing up, 
that their parents made it just normal for them. There certainly are other ways to become generous, but, but they will have hurdles to get over to get there that people who grew up in a household the parents, this is just normal, won't have. Thank you. I have a, qu I have a question. Uh, I'm, my name is Tony Cooper, and I'm the uh, Director of Stewardship and Development for the Catholic Church that I belong to. And you used in your advertisement, I saw time, talent, and treasure listed in kind of the ad, and that's exactly the way that we talk about stewardship at our church. And we do one annual uh, appeal for treasure, which is going to be this weekend, as a matter of fact. <laughs> we do an annual appeal for time and talent, which is in the fall. And we ask people to share their stories about how giving of their time, talent, and treasure as parishioners mm -hmm. to talk about how that's made them better, how it has benefited them. But we only do that now twice a year. Is there an optimal amount of, time, of, of times per year that a church could or should have people sharing their witnesses? I don't know based on empirical research. I would say based on what I know generally, the more the generosity and vision and practice are built into the ordinary culture of any organization rather than, oh, it's that time of year again, the more people will follow that and think of themselves, here's what I'm part of, here's who I am, here's where we're going. Um, I do think it's good to have, well, right, I'm not making the normative claim. I do think sociologically you need to have stewardship Sundays and so on to really focus people's attention. But I think more, but I think it's even better to somehow build into, this is just the culture where a, a stewardship people, not stewardship Sunday, and um, how exactly that's done, I mean, it requires leadership, it requires all sorts of aspects to make it work. Um, one other thought on the time, treasure, talent, that's a double-edged sword because it, it's liberating for people to realize, oh, there's a lot more here that I can be generous with than just money but it also gives a certain kind of person an out to say, I don't have to give any money because I hold the door once a month or something like that. Uh, so from a, Christian tradition, from a Christian tradition point of view, yeah, there is time, talent, and money, but from a Christian tradition point of view, if you take scripture seriously, money is a huge thing. You don't bypass money. It could kill you. So in our data, it's very clear that, uh, that we have to like, institute that you have to talk about it on a regular basis. There's no magic number, but when you have Stewardship Sunday, when you have the, the capital campaign season, that's when people can't hear it, right? That's when they expect it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's cultivating um, a, a culture of generosity over time that really shapes people's imagination and routinizes their way of being to think of them. And there are, there are some churchgoers who they literally have figured out a switch that once it's, oh, it's that week. Exactly. One last question, I believe, at the top. Hi, uh, Professor Smith. I actually took your class a few years ago at Notre Dame, um, and now I live here in Indy, so I'm Can happy to see you. Can you raise your hand or jump up? So see we, you oh, here. okay, yeah, hi. <laughs> I think I took your class, I think it was my freshman year, so it was a while ago now. What's your name? Michelle Mezzanot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just sit down. <laughs> so, you got the A, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good job. Uh, so my question is kind of for any of the profs down there. Uh, so something that I've noticed. So one of the areas that, for example, I'm passionate about is, you know, supporting local food sources or supporting local farms and, and that sort of thing. And I've noticed uh, in Indianapolis, and I think this is happening in other cities as well that that is something that's kind of you know, growing, maybe a trend or maybe just uh, an area people are interested in. And I think that it, it, for example, and you could, I think, take it to other places as well, um, it, it makes people feel empowered, right? Like, I'll pay a little bit more for this organic food or for this local food, help out the local farmers, help out the local community, local businesses, but I still get something out of it, right? I get healthier food, I can say I live a healthier lifestyle, that sort of thing. So, you know, not technically, giving, you know, just not technically monetary giving, but I'm wondering if any of you have thought about any of that in your research or, um, you know, have any thoughts on, on that sort of thing. So maybe something that younger people are doing, like I'm giving, but I'm right. also getting something back. 
So the focus of the, my talk tonight and our discussion is giving money. But my Science of Generosity project conceives of generosity very broadly, that there are very many ways we can be generous. And, um, and we try to have measures of those. So yes, I'm a, and including generous and how, what kind of products we buy, actually. People can, for certain subjective motives, choose to buy this instead of that, in their understanding, to be more generous in the world that they live in. So yes, yeah, just affirming that conceptually. Um, the other distinction I, that I want to make, and maybe this is a little niggly, but I think it helps to, it helps to make this distinction and it has practical ramifications, is we don't conceive of generosity and altruism as the same. Altruism is a strong expending of oneself purely for the well-being of another. From, from our project's point of view, generosity can be very also self-serving, not in a pejorative way, but that is people, or put it this way, people almost always have mixed motives for what they do. Sometimes people act in pure altruism, but mostly people are confused and have mixed motives. And as far as I'm concerned, that's perfectly legitimate if people do things partly to impress their spouse, partly to think grandma would be proud of me, partly for all sorts of, that's fine. I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, but part of that too is they care about the well-being of other people. So to bring that back to your point, if people do it because they think the lettuce they buy locally that's organic will be healthier, and they pay more money for it, but they also want to support local, um, the local uh, regional economy, I think that conceptually it's good to have a wide enough and a robust enough idea of generosity that can appreciate and account for all this variety of ways that people can be generous toward the world, not just giving money, if that makes sense. Well, Chris, your words inspire us and they challenge us. And in many ways, I think all of us probably have stories in mind of those uh, generous uh, practices uh, with our parents, with our social networks. Uh, and, and Tom Lake, who's, whose name is tied to this lecture, it's, it's a similar story. Uh, a parents are coal miner from mm -hmm. modest means, but watch that generosity happen as, as his parents took the check or took the money and actually parsed out money to be given to church, to the community. And that was instilled in him from an early age and he never forgot it. And in many ways, that's, that's the legacy of the Lake Institute. Uh, and we're grateful for, for Tom Lake, his parents, and the vision that he uh, embodied and how he shared that with our community here in Indianapolis and far beyond. And we're grateful for your words that challenged us this evening too. Um, uh, Let's give Chris a round of applause.